All right. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to the second webinar for the private well class, um, Proper Care of Your Private Well. Again, um, I'm Steve Wilson from the State Water Survey, and I have Jennifer Wilson from the Water Resources Center and Cassia Smith from the Water Survey here as well. Um, this class is sponsored through a grant from US EPA to the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, as you can read there. And um, let's get started. Um, OK, so today's topic, um, I'm going to again talk about what is a private well class. I'm sure there are a few people online today that weren't uh, on the first webinar and uh, then what we're going to cover and some logistics um, for using GoToWebinar and um, answering, asking questions and then the material for today. And then at the end, we will um, again try to answer questions. So um, as we go through here, so private well class, it's 10 lessons that are sent via email over 10 weeks. It's self-paced. Um, if some of you have just recently signed up or if you haven't signed up for the classes versus the webinar, uh, please do so. Um, these webinars are really meant to provide a little additional information or uh, provide it in a different form. Um, the lessons really have much more detail and um, you know, are the meat, so to speak, of, of the class. So if you go to privatewellclass.org, you can see on the front page a place to sign up for the lessons if you haven't already. And um, there's also a enrolling class button near the top. So um, we actually changed our front page. The picture of the nice uh, water dripping into the bucket isn't there anymore. But um, this is the front page uh, for the class. Um, it's got the information for the webinars. Most of you, I assume, have been there since uh, you are enrolled. OK, so um, I went ahead and put this slide up again because we've had a number of folks who thought the webinar was the class. And uh, if that's still the case with any of you, um, it's not. It's, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the class is much more detailed, has a lot more information, and it's emailed to you as sort of a newsletter so that you have that information available to you uh, just to keep and print out or do whatever you like. Um, luckily, the way this is set up, um, you can enroll at any time, and the lessons will start one a week for 10 weeks. And um, regarding these webinars, in case I forget to mention it, um, they will be repeated. So this is the second of three. The next one is, I believe, February 27th. But later this spring, we'll do one, two, and three over again, and then one more time uh, in the summer. OK, so enrolling in the class, this is more what our front page looks like today. And uh, when you click on that Enroll in Class button, you get this. Uh, there's really only three things you need to sign up, and that's uh, an email address. And we'd like to know what state you're from. It should be state or territory, and um, your first name. So um, real quickly, uh, there are 10 lessons. Um, if you signed up before January 9th, when we first launched the class, um, you should be getting Lesson 5 today if you signed up after that. You're somewhere in between, and uh, that's fine. Um, these are the first five lessons. Um, and here are the, the next five. Uh, today's webinar should be mostly about five, six, and seven. And the webinar on the 27th will be about uh, eight, nine, and 10. And again, um, we don't have the time for the webinar to go near the detail that uh, is available with uh, the written lessons. So um, be sure to take a look at those when they come out. Um, OK, I'll skip that since we've already talked about it. Today's the second lesson of three. Um, so about the webinar, it is being recorded. Uh, the first one was recorded, and it's available on our website, or there's a link to YouTube on our website. Um, they will be repeated. We did have uh, nearly 400 people sign up for the webinar today. And so what we're asking is that um, you use the question box, which many of you have already done uh, in responding uh, this, this afternoon, to answer any questions you might have as we go through the material. And also, um, we need to try to stick to the material that we're presenting today. Um, eventually, we'll write down every question. They'll all be uh, answered and on our website. Some of these questions we obviously can't answer ourselves. And um, I'm going out to other experts to get that information. Um, but we will answer every question we get. If not today, then um, eventually it'll be on our website. So, and again, the lessons do provide more detail. OK, so here's the webinar window. If um, you're having any problems with that, let us know. 
but um, you just ask a question here and, and we'll see it and we're making a list of those um, once the lesson part is over of the webinar today um, we'll take a short break to go through the questions and then we'll answer as many as we can in the time we have today okay so this is the first slide for the material today before we go any further um, there's a poll if you look over on your um, webinar bar uh, there's a button for polls it says zero of one and um, you can go there and do I need to launch the poll or how does that work okay so I'm going to launch the poll and uh, we ask that you answer that We'll just take a minute or so for everyone to answer that question and um, then we'll get moving. Uh, part of the reason for asking this is to have an idea of how many folks that we're actually uh, participating. Um, we need to include that to the information we send our sponsor. And uh, for those of you that maybe put five plus, um, if you don't mind shooting us an email with the number of uh, folks that are watching uh, with you today, well, that would be great. And uh, it also helps us uh, identify if we're really reaching out to some of the groups that are hosting webinars and uh, where those might be. And um, we really appreciate your help. All right, we'll go about uh, another half a minute or so here, and then 92% uh, have voted so far, and uh, we will close the poll and show the results. All right. All right now I think um, I'm told that over on the right side you should be able to see the results. Um, so if you want to look at the poll, oh, it shows up um, on your screen. It does it online. All right. Uh, thanks for everyone who participated, and um, we'll move on. Okay. I um, need to back up here. <laughs> Operator error. All right. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, the first thing we're going to talk about today is correcting poor construction. And really, um, there are a lot of wells that were grandfathered into the existing well codes today. Uh, so there are wells that are in pits and hand dug wells. Um, and they really, there's two problems with those sorts of systems. One, um, they're an opportunity for surface contamination, either from a pit um, that can flood or um, have things fall in it, uh, or from a, a dug well perspective, if it's a, a really old hand dug well, it's usually uncemented brick or stones, um, there's preferential flow in the soil around those uh, that have developed, and surface water can run right in in a lot of cases. Uh, plus there's safety hazard, um, and I'll show some examples of that in a minute. But, um, you know, construction codes have changed a lot to deal with those issues. And uh, hand dug wells are really no longer allowed in, in most places. I'm not sure if they are anywhere at all or not uh, in the states or territories. But, um, you know, some of us grew up on those kind of wells. Um, you know, I may have mentioned this last time. I don't know. But um, I remember coming home from college one weekend, and uh, we had to get frogs out of our well. And so um, it's not a good situation or a safe one. And uh, so there are things that should be corrected if... Um, as far as a best practice for your well. So here's two examples. Um, in, an, in lesson five, uh, the, the figure on the right is, is used uh, in our lesson. It's from uh, Manitoba has um, a description of how to correct 
a well that's in a pit. And the figure on the left, um, Washington State Department of Ecology, has a blog. And uh, one of their blog posts recently was about um, a woman who had uh, fell to her death because the plywood over their well gave way. And so um, you know, what ends up happening is, over time, uh, whatever might be on top of your well deteriorates. It's not taken care of. People plan to fix it and not necessarily do. And uh, it's just not a safe situation to have. So what do we need to do? You need to bring them up to code. Um, and the idea there would be to, one, find out, um, talk to a contractor or your well authority in your state or territory and uh, what the code is today. Um, bring a pipe up to the surface, fill in the large diameter hole that you have with clay and grout. Um, use a pitless adapter to run your line if you need to. I know in some southwestern states or in warmer climates, you may not need to use a pitless. Um, and bring it up to code, basically, and it's safe. Um, it's also um, safe for your family and your livestock if you have it, or um, even the equipment, uh, mowers, those sorts of things. Um, you know, some of these are even buried, and folks haven't been in their well for years, uh, and people fall through and uh, can cause a lot of problems. So here's two examples. The figure on the left is a picture I took of a dug well. We sampled, um, I think I had this in the last presentation as well. It's just a great example of um, what you don't want to do. It's an old hand dug well. It's cement blocks underneath. They've got boards that uh, they can take off with pieces of tin and some concrete blocks keeping it all held down. You know, this lets insects in, uh, rodents, uh, things fall in there and die, um, which causes uh, you know, bacterial problems. And um, the well on the left is um, a finished well, the same one we looked at in the last picture with the corrugated pipe for the well pit, and this is what it looked like when they were done. And so much safer and cleaner construction. It's using a pitless, and uh, it uh, just protects you and your family. So some information on protecting your pump. Um, you need to realize that you know pumps don't last forever, but there are things you can do that um, will make them last longer. Um, you know, some of the problems that people talk about a lot are your pump cycling on a lot, and some of those we'll get to a few of those questions in a minute. But um, the thing to do is to maintain your pump so that it cycles as little as it needs to, as long as it's properly sized and you have the right size pressure tank to work with it. Um, you know, it's meant to run anywhere from 15 to 25 times an hour during use um, or less. And um, there are some things you can do uh, uh, to make sure that that's the case. Um, also, the other thing that's really damaging to pumps are sediment. If your well's pumping sand, especially, or any other sediment from your well, um, it can cause more wear and uh, eventually cause your pump to wear out and seals to go bad uh, much quicker. So if you have a bedrock well, uh, which means your well is open hole uh, below the top of the bedrock, um, if there's a particular area of, that, uh, of your well, a, a depth, that may have more sediment, you can try raising or lowering your pump. Um, and it may help with that. Um, it may be that your pump set close to the where the casing is seated, and uh, there's a lot of velocity coming uh, into your well from the more fractured parts uh, at the top of the rock. And it might be good to lower your pump further down into uh, the well. Um, if you have a sand and gravel well, uh, the, your pump could be too close to your intake, and the velocity right at the intake is usually the strongest. And so if it's too close to your screen, it's causing preferential flow through there, which may allow some of the more finer materials to come through. Um, it could also be a screen problem. Um, as your well ages, uh, it starts to have preferential flow through the screen. You have buildup of, um, if there's ever been um, sediment, deposited in your well that maybe precipitates out. Uh, your screen can be plugged in some places, and so then the screen that's remained open has to provide uh, more water uh, to make up for those areas that aren't, and it could cause uh, higher velocities, which will pull more uh, sediment into your well. Um, some common, common pump problems um, that you need to deal with or that happen frequently. Um, Rapid cycling of your pump, 
Um, if that happens, it's usually an indication that there's something wrong with your pressure tank in most cases. And um, what's happened uh, is either if you have a bladder tank, it's ruptured, and so um, there's no air causing that increase in pressure. So your tank fills up, um, pressurizes the system, and as soon as you turn your faucet back on, uh, the tank is at the low end of its pressure again, and uh, it kicks the pump back on. If you um, don't have a bladder type tank, but have an air type tank, um, those can become waterlogged, as we discussed in uh, one of the in lesson four, I believe, which uh, if you've already received that. Um, Air dissolves in water, so eventually you'll have to continue to add air to your air bladder pump or tank in order to make sure that there's enough air in there to compress to have your tank work effectively. And um, so that's really the two issues with that. Um, your pump running excessively um, and high energy consumption. Um, you probably have an undetected leak in your system. Um, hopefully that's something that you can determine if your well is far away from your house. It could be in your line. Um, it could be um, uh, even a hole in your uh, drop pipe uh, coming up from your well. So basically you're cycling water and uh, you should also be able to notice that because of uh, uh, you're unable to maintain pressure. And if those things occur, um, the only thing you can do is inspect your plumbing and all your pipes and look for wet spots on the ground between your well and your house. And uh, if none of those are the case, maybe pull your pump and see if you have that kind of problem. So if your breaker trips after a few seconds, um, more than likely what's happened is that you have some kind of short in your pump. Um, you know, it's uh, sealed electric lines that go down to a, for a submersible pump. And um, if something's happened there, um, something's corroded or um, some of the rubber's given way or dry rotted. Not, I guess it wouldn't dry rot per se, but you know, if it's if it's gone bad, um, then you might be causing a short. And so every time you turn your pump on and water gets to that connection, it uh, trips your breaker. And obviously, if your pump won't come on at all, um, then your motor's not getting power. And so um, there's several things that could be happening. Um, you could have a blown fuse. Uh, maybe you have uh, the or a breaker. Um, you could have had an issue where insects have gotten in uh, your contacts or um, caused some kind of issue uh, that you need to then go out and check with a voltmeter and correct. Um, for low yield wells. If your well only produces a few gallons a minute, then one, your pump needs to be sized appropriately. If you have too large a pump and you draw down the water level in the well quickly, um, you can start pumping air. You can damage the pump that way. You can also burn up your motor. Um, it's using the water to help cool it. And so one of the things you can do if you have a low yield well is install a low pressure cutoff switch uh, to protect your pump. And this is a separate pressure switch connected to your line that detects a lot of times they're set to 10 PSI. And the idea behind that is if um, when you start, uh, when your pump, when the water level gets down to your pump level, um, it can't maintain pressure because it can't keep up and continue to push water up to your house. And eventually uh, the line will lose pressure. And when you get down to 10, it shuts it off. And it's an automatic switch that um, you have to manually reset so that your pump can't keep kicking on. And uh, again, running your pump uh, in that manner is uh, very hard on it. And um, so it's, it's a good uh, thing to have if you're in that situation. Um, many people with low yield wells have, uh, wells have large pressure tanks. Um, because your well doesn't produce much water in gallons per minute, um, your pump is on longer on, in times when no one's using water, like overnight your tank fills so that um, you have the water you need, to, need in your pressure tank uh, for those peak times, like in the morning when you're taking showers. And so um, if you're having a problem where uh, your pump's kicking off, if you do have a pressure switch or you're not able to maintain pressure, then you want, might want to consider getting a larger pressure tank. So um, all in all, 
low yield wells are problematic for a number of reasons. Um, they, because of the wide range in water levels, and a lot of these are bedrock wells, um, when some of the bedrock is exposed to air, it can change the chemistry, releasing metals um, or causing sediment formation, and uh, those things cause scale buildup on the components in your well. And um, I know they can also provide uh, for biofilm growth because um, as your pump kicks on and off, your water level in your well could be varying by 40, 100, 150 feet or more. Um, and those changes cause changes in chemistry. You know, before there was a well there, um, that material was always uh, submerged or underwater, if you will. And so um, changing that chemistry and allowing air to get in uh, causes an effect. I was at a presentation in, um, for a National Groundwater Association meeting where they had a gentleman talking about changes in low yield wells uh, in Pennsylvania. And this was in regard to um, some of the fracking issues that are going on out there, um, which I am not going to get into today. Um, but it was interesting, they had collected samples at different times of the day in the same well and found wide-ranging chemistry changes. And it was because of this raising and lowering of water levels, and they were fairly significant. And so, um, you know, one sample necessarily isn't going to give you the whole story. Um, might when I get to that part of this, um, if you are going to take water samples, especially looking at mineralogy or metals, it might be a good idea to do a sample right at the beginning when your pump has been off for a long time and one near the, after your pump's been on for quite a while and see what kind of differences you might see. Um, anyway, there's, there's a lot of chemistry issues that go on with these wells. Pressure tanks. Okay, so today most tanks are, pressure, are bladder tanks. They're they require less maintenance, they uh, work really well, they maintain their air better uh, because you don't have the issue of air um, dissolving and bleeding into the water. And so um, by far those are the tanks that are installed today. But if you have an older tank, um, one of the things, I learned this from uh, Minnesota Department of Health, um, they do require more maintenance, but um, they can act as sort of a, a low-tech uh, treatment device. And if you have dissolved gases or solids dissolved in your water, um, when that water gets in your tank, if you have a, a air-water interface, um, it can cause those things to either precipitate out or the gases to bleed out of the water because the pressure is lower than it was when in the ground. And so um, if you um, have that sort of situation where when you turn on your faucet and you get methane or hydrogen sulfide, um, or you have a lot of sediment, uh, especially iron-type sediment um, or manganese, then you may want to consider even going to one of these sorts of tanks. It can act as, um, you know, the first line of, of taking care of some of those issues. Um, you need to make sure that you vent your gases out of your home, not just have a vent on the tank. And um, you also need um, to have a way to remove those solids that are going to collect in the bottom of your tank. Um, and it would be more maintenance, but it's certainly going to be less trouble at your faucet. Um, one other thing, a lot of times, um, if a pump doesn't shut off when it's supposed to for some reason, you can build up pressure in your lines and cause all kinds of problems, rupture a tank, uh, rupture a line, or a, uh, break a valve, whatever. So one thing that's a, a best practice, so to speak, for um, near your pressure tank or on your pressure tank is to put a pressure relief valve. And these are a valve that is set higher than what your operating pressures are, so that if for some reason your pump keeps working, even though no one's using the water and you have no leaks, the pressure doesn't build up in your system so much that it causes some kind of, uh, you know, I'll call it catastrophic failure of pipe or tank or whatever. Um, they should be sized so that they can handle the complete volume of your pump and um, they're just another safety precaution to protect. Uh, you know, if you were apt to happen to be in your basement or near your tank when it ruptured, um, it would sure uh, could be a real safety issue. Okay, so for some best practices. Um, one of the best things you can do is maintain a file system for your water system. And that means uh, keeping accurate records, um, all the things that you do to your well, 
when a problem occurs, you know, you'll be able to go back to your records and, and see what you've done in the past or what a contractor's done for you, by who, you know, what was installed, and, um, you know, it just give you a lot more information to help determine what your next steps might be and help with possible causes of what's going on. So the real purpose is because you're proactive and you have this information and you're more familiar with it, um, it will hopefully save you significant time and money. And going without water is a miserable thing, as um, I'm sure some of you know, and, um, and this may help. Things that you need, um, your well log, um, warranties for all the equipment that you use, including treatment um, dates of when you have went out and checked your well. We're going to go through some other best practices like checking uh, your wellhead and you know ensuring that everything is working the way it's supposed to. Um, anything related to your well or your water system that's been done so that you have a complete record of here's what I did this day. Even when you check your pressure tank, um, if you have to add air, um, all those things, then when you talk to a contractor, they'll know that one, that you've been a good steward of your system and that helps them understand what, you know, this isn't because someone's just let their system go for the last five years uh, and it's just, you know, it's in that kind of shape versus you've been a good, you've taken care of things, you've managed things, and so there must be some other issue. So some best practices, um, you know, use a licensed driller, pump installer, or contractor. I know, I believe Pennsylvania is the only state that doesn't license drillers, but um, most drillers around the country and installers and contractors um, are certified through the National Groundwater Association, and if you are in a jurisdiction that doesn't have licensed drillers, I would be sure to use someone who has at least been certified through NGWA. Um, that way you're guaranteed at least they have a minimum set of skills um, and have passed you know, um, a certification exam that shows that they're competent in what they're doing. Um, inspect your wellhead at least annually. Um, that means you know, things can happen. Um, somebody hit it with a mower or um, you know, um, a seals went bad or um, a bolt's rusted off. Um, make sure that um, you keep your well sealed, your cap sealed. You know, you don't want insects in your well. You want to make sure there's still a screen on your vent tube. Um, those things just are good management practices. Um, keep your the area near your well clear of debris speaks for itself. Um, use backflow devices and vacuum breakers. For those of you that may be on uh, farms or have a garden where you're using your a hose or um, pumping water into a tank uh, for pesticides or uh, fertilizer or whatever, um, you should always use a backflow device just to make sure that there's no way um, if a pump kicks off and there's back suction that something doesn't get in your well. Um, once it does, then um, you know depending on what it is, uh, you basically have no choice but to try to flush it out or um, do some other kind of treatment. Um, it could make your well unusable, unusable, and it's just not worth the risk uh, when these devices are available and fairly easy to um, to put in. Um, properly maintain your septic system. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, if you are new to a uh, private well system or new to living in a rural area and you have a septic system, um, there's a lot of information available on how to best take care of that. Um, there's best practices you need to follow. Um, it needs to be pumped regularly, uh, depending on the size. And um, I can't stress enough that um, what you put in, your toilet, your drain, your sink, uh, ends up in your septic system. You're the steward of your wastewater management. And uh, some of the things you do can really uh, affect how that operates and how long it lasts. So. Um, Consider installing an access port for measuring water levels. Um, this is something that's not very common, but the state of Oregon requires new wells to have an access port for measuring water levels. It's actually a great idea, um, and some may disagree with that, but um, what they do basically is put a three-quarter inch tube along the pump column, and it actually has its own access port at the top for measuring water levels. And so you can drop a tape down that, or a Solence, which is an electronic uh, water level measuring device, and um, for those of us like me that sample and take water level measurements in many private wells, um, well over a thousand wells in my career, um, not having to op up, open up that entire 
cap and not dealing with um, rusty bolts and um, some of the issues that uh, that you can cause problems or even whenever you try to take a measurement in a well uh, you're dealing with a wiring you can get a tape stuck um, all those sorts of issues having a dedicated port for um, taking a water level measurement is a great idea and I know out west um, in areas where water rights are issues and um, knowing how much water you have is is certainly um, more important as far as uh, you're more likely to run out of water than some of the folks in other parts of the country it's just it's a great idea and um, if you're installing a new well at some point it's something I would uh, suggest you consider doing um, and sampling well annually now um, we're going to go more into that, and so I'll, I'll leave it there. But you really should sample your well regularly. Um, things can happen, things you don't know about. Um, I mentioned you could have a something happen to the top of your well. Um, I know if my boys were mowing our yard and they accidentally hit the top of our well cap uh, and it's PVC uh, with the mower, I probably wouldn't hear about it. I'd have to find it out on my own. And so things like that um, make it worth always sampling your well. Uh, just because there's you know unknowns that you can't uh, necessarily uh, be sure of or uh, know that have happened. So as far as sampling goes, you should sample annually. Um, anytime your well is repaired or serviced, um, anytime you notice any change in color, taste, or odor um, after it's been chlorinated or disinfected, um, if someone has a recurring illness, uh, and I'm reading these, I realize, or if an infant or pregnant person uh, is going at the home. Um, and especially for nitrate there and um, or if a neighbor that you know has a similar well um, and is close by has a water quality problem that's been identified so these are all just common sense um, as far as what to test for um, oh I'm yeah coliform bacteria and nitrate annually um, for sure pH is a good thing to um, sample for just to have an idea of how corrosive your water might be. It's harder on pipes, it can be harder on fittings. And I meant to change this. One of the things um, we recommend here is uh, taking a sample for hardness. Just to know um, how hard your water is, it matters for them. Um, many people have softeners, how often you have to change uh, out your softener and those sorts of things. Um, TDS is a good indicator of some other things and that's why um, I had it here originally. But um, you should always talk about to your health department as well about other things that might be a concern if you're in an area where there's a lot of arsenic in the groundwater, for instance, um, or um, a karst area. Um, you may want to sample more often for coliform bacteria. I know we have several counties in Illinois that are um, uh, karst, which is you know caves, limestone uh, solution caves, and those sorts of things. Um, there's a lot of uh, surface contamination because of sinkholes, and um, you know 70 to 80 percent of the samples the county health department in those counties do um, are positive for coliform bacteria. Um, same for a dug well, um, because they're taking water from near the surface, and if it's an old hand dug well, it's not protected very well at the surface. Um, you should sample more often until you feel confident that you know over the course of a year during spring versus fall some of those things that um, it's not a problem um, a lot of times it is and I know um, I grew up on a dug well um, we would chlorinate it um, and a few months later it would be um, positive again and uh, it was a routine cycle so um, one other thing I want to mention the water survey in Illinois collects uh, does sampling for private well owners in, in Illinois and um, we've always taken the approach of having folks send us two sets of samples one that's before any kind of treatment whether it's a softener filter or whatever and another that's after all that and uh, the idea there being we can get more of a sense of the groundwater quality on one side and the drinking water quality on the other and I know um, uh, well, it's been almost 10 years ago now. I took a look at a set of data um, where the, uh, the folks that sent their samples in, this was about 400 samples, where they had uh, arsenic over 1 ppb, which the standard's 10. But we had detectable arsenic, and so I took out the samples 
um, or the homeowners that had sent in two sets because they had a softener or some other kind of treatment, and I looked at what different things might do to that arsenic value. And what we found is that even though a softener isn't meant to take out arsenic, um, in some cases because of the way the chemistry is, uh, the average sample that had uh, arsenic over 1 ppb initially, and some of them were very high, over 200, um, the softeners helped take out 42% uh, of the arsenic. And so in some isolated cases, based on the chemistry at that well, um, a softener was able to help with their arsenic uh, contamination. And so um, it's pretty interesting that stuff that can happen. Um, again, I'm not suggesting that a softener is a good treatment solution for arsenic. Um, it just happens in some cases it helps. Okay, abandoned wells. Um, abandoned wells are a huge problem all over the country. Um, because well logs weren't required um, in some areas until the 80s. In Illinois it was 1963, but I know in some states it was mid-80s. Um, there are actually more wells that we don't have a record of or there's no public record of than there are wells on file. And what that means is um, you see stories uh, of folks who have fallen in a well or that um, you know there's been some kind of safety hazard. Um, so there's a risk there because it's an unknown source, or maybe the farmstead's gone and the well was never sealed. Um, many states now have rules that say you need to seal a well after so many years if it's not been used, um, but it's an expense, and a lot of folks just out of sight, out of mind, and they don't get taken care of. Um, but if you have an abandoned well on your property, now most states do require you to properly abandon it. And I know it's not necessarily enforced because of manpower issues and uh, and that sort of thing, but if you have an abandoned well and someone falls in it or it contaminates an aquifer because you didn't seal it properly or you haven't protected it properly, um, you're liable. And for no other reason, if you have an abandoned well, that's a great reason to get it taken care of and done properly. And, um, you know, a well contractor can do that for you. Um, so here's some information. The um, there's a horse down a well. It's an old abandoned well. The horse went through a fence and was walking on some property and fell in. Um, this, these, um, these two pictures I actually I linked to from uh, Washington Department of Ecology's blog that talked about abandoned wells um, uh, with the picture I showed before. Um, sometimes folks are lucky, sometimes they're not. I don't know how many of you remember um, Jessica McClure. She was the 18-month-old that fell into a well uh, I think it was like in 1987, and uh, it made national news. Um, so this, on the right side here, these headlines, um, our DNR used to have a well sealing coalition, and in 1999 they put together a demonstration and a, a nice booklet that described information about well sealing and best practices and had media coverage and all that stuff, and I took this from, from that page. Um, you know, some folks aren't as lucky, um, and these were all back in the 90s uh, and 80s in Illinois, um, and so it happens. It's just it doesn't make national news like Jessica McClure did necessarily, but, um, you know, the, they're there, and uh, a lot of folks uh, have been injured or even killed by them. So going back to septic systems. Um, you really have to manage your septic system just like you do your water system. You need to um, maintain it, do best practices with it, and if you properly manage it, you can maintain how long it'll last. Now, I, I said here they will eventually fail. They will. They all fail eventually because you're putting organics out into a leach field, and eventually, uh, over time, it may be 30 years, but eventually there's going to be enough organic material to get into that leach field that it won't. Uh, work effectively. And so um, at that point it needs to be rebuilt um, or moved, but you can do a lot of things to maintain that system that long. If you never have your septic tank pumped, for instance, um, your septic system isn't going to last nearly that long and you're going to end up with uh, sewage backing up in your house or a nice sewage wet spot in your yard. Um, and so um, you need to take care of it. So don't put toxins down the drain. Um, your waste It's a wastewater system, just like a community wastewater system. It's being treated just using natural biological treatment 
to take care of the waste that you put in uh, your system. Putting toxics, other things that don't belong in down your drain um, can disrupt that process, kill bacteria, um, and it can't do its job. And so uh, that's the quickest way to cause problems uh, with your septic system. And um, a lot of folks don't even know where the drain field is. You need to understand where it is and actually find out where it is. Um, there's a new law that was passed that makes it illegal to have systems that are piped directly into a stream or an open source. You have to have an NPDES permit now if you have one of those. Um, if you take a boat along any river uh, where there's a lot of homes along the river, you'll see a pipe discharge where that's the way it was done. And um, now they're illegal or now you have to have a, a permit from uh, your state in order to actually have a system set up that way. And so um, if you don't know, you know, it's your responsibility to find out. And again, this we haven't even mentioned here how a failing septic system um, or an improperly placed septic system can affect your water, your drinking water, and your water well. So here's two examples. Um, I just wanted to show there's two different types of absorption fields here shown on the right. Um, your septic tanks on the left, you either you run laterals, so uh, the way it works, everything comes into your tank, um, the solids fall out, and there's clear water and some, some scum floating on top. Now this is an example from Montana. They require an effluent filter on the water going out into your uh, drainage field. Um, I don't believe every state does require that. It's a good idea though. It makes, uh, makes it such that your drainage field is going to last longer because there won't be solids that get into those pipes and, and clog it up. Um, so you can do this two ways. You can do a trench design if you have um, soil that's, well, yeah, if you have soil that's more able to accept those fluids and if you don't, you basically create an absorption field for your, you have a the complete bed full of gravel and rock so that you have more volume available uh, for the, the fluids that come out of your uh, septic tank. So there's an access port, or there should be for your tank. Your tank is sized based on, um, well, it may have been sized for the previous landowner or well owner, um, but it should be sized based on the number of people in your home and expected water use. And so based on that, there are, there's information on how often you need to have that uh, pumped to get the solids out. Okay, um, emergencies. Um, I put this at the top. This is doubly true for folks that live on public water supplies, but most people don't realize how important their water is until they don't have it. Going without is tough. I mentioned I grew up on a dug well. We had livestock. Um, I would be in charge of filling up a horse tank or a cattle tank, and sometimes uh, as a kid I would uh, put the hose in the tank and walk away and forget. Now our well was 14 feet deep, uncemented brick, and it was in a very clay till type soil without a good sand lens that provided a lot of extra water. Um, when I did that a couple twice uh, that I can remember, um, we were without water for several days, and the water we got whenever it started to come back was cloudy and smelled funny and uh, just not a good situation. So um, going without water is tough and um, when something happens where you can't use your water supply and you want to try to get that back online as quickly as you can. Now as far as wells going dry, I know uh, through the Midwest this last summer because of uh, the drought we experienced, many board and dug wells and shallow wells went dry. Um, you know, shallow wells in some cases were sand points where um, they were just in the top of the aquifer. It's an unconfined system, and because water levels drop so much over the summer, even in the aquifers uh, in some places, uh, there was no water in their well. Um, people have to haul water. They use their cisterns. And all I can say there, I mean, we can't cover all this today. Um, more will be in, in, which is lessons uh, six or seven, I think. Um, there are things you need to do for best practices. If you're going to haul water, make sure you have a tank that's been uh, properly disinfected. And make sure that you know all the lines you're using going from either your well to the tank or vice versa, or if you're going directly into your house, have been disinfected. Um, you know, if you're using a cistern. 
A lot of older homes have a cistern on their property. Um, it should be disinfected as well. And uh, you know those are short-term solutions. And uh, if you have an ongoing issue where you're running out of water, you might want to look at other options and talk to um, your state um, or jurisdiction about possible other types of wells you might be able to put in. Um, if a well gets flooded, you know, you should just assume it's contaminated. You need to disinfect it and sample again before using it. Once you've disinfected, you need to run that chlorinated water through all your lines, and make sure that it's uh, safe to drink again. And uh, so it's just it's going to be a matter of time that you're going to be without water. But um, when a flooding event occurs, um, there's a myriad of things. There's oil floating or gas floating on the top of uh, the water in some cases, um, or other contaminants that um, you just need to be safe and, and not use it. Um, if you're in an area that's prone to losing power, or um, you know, I grew up in the country where um, we would be without power for several days in some cases during the winter, um, the best solution is to have a backup generator. And um, you know, I don't know. Um, another solution there. And we're not talking about loss of power to your well or your pump. We're talking about loss of, loss of power to your farmstead uh, or your homestead or uh, the entire property. Um, you know, the generator does a lot more than can run your well. It can, you know, keep your freezer and your refrigerator going and, and all those things. So it's really just a good practice um, if you're going to live in, the, in, in a rural area uh, to have a backup generator. And forest fires, there's some states that offer advice on um, what to do when you've had a forest fire. Uh, the main thing is to check out your well and make sure you know, wires aren't melted. Um, if it smells funny after that, your water, or tastes funny, uh, flush your lines. Um, it can have an earthy or smoky smell or taste to it even. Um, but the main thing is make sure your system um, is still uh, operable and uh, nothing's been damaged. Um, and the best solution would be to have a contractor check out your system after any of those things have occurred. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about local groups and citizens groups. Um, in different parts of the country, there are these groups that are developed. They usually start out as a focus on one issue. I know um, in some cases protect wetlands or source water protection or there's a lot of reasons, but they're usually volunteers and um, sometimes they get an expert or a facilitator, which you know, a county health department or co-op extension office person who's interested in those topics would be a good facilitator for those things. Um, they start this local group and they deal with education-based issues and try to provide information to the residents in their area. Um, and the idea is information is power, you have a shared problem, there's shared solutions. And they really can be a powerful voice. And I'm just going to give you a couple examples. Um, you know, here's this blog is called Watery Foundation. It's a guy who's, I believe, a geologist. He puts out information that's relevant uh, to Florida's water issues. They have a fragile resource. They have a lot of saltwater intrusion. Um, they have a lot of contamination issues in certain parts as development occurred. And it's just one man trying to get the word out about what people can do uh, to help protect uh, their resource. Once it's gone, it's gone. Um, this is another group. This is the group's here in Illinois. It's called the Barrington Area Council of Governments. Now, they've developed into a local steward on all of their water issues. They hold um, these test kit drop-off days. They collect samples and work with different county health departments to organize those things. They try to get folks in their area motivated and um, interested in learning more about their water systems. And they do the, all the legwork through their volunteers uh, to get folks uh, to do those sorts of things. They even hold pharmaceutical set, uh, collection days. And um, you know, they basically just do the legwork to make it easy for people to do things that protect uh, their fragile resources up there. Uh, one other group I want to mention uh, is REN, the Water Resources Education Network. This is actually a program from the League of Women Voters in Pennsylvania. And uh, you know, they have an education fund. This is where they've decided to put their resources. This is, they have a newsletter that comes out, um, I believe, every month, um, which I subscribe to. It's got a lot of useful information on a lot of things that are going on in Pennsylvania that help well owners or those that are stewards of source water protection in those areas. And so there are a lot of these types of groups. Um, maybe there isn't one in your area. 
but again, a lot of them form for one specific issue and cause, and uh, if anything, you should see what groups might be available. I know there's some source water groups in Wisconsin that are pretty active that are tied to DNR uh, up there, I believe, and so um, it's worth checking out. So for getting local help, um, you know, the whole point of bringing that up and making this an issue is that, you know, we're in one location, we're in central Illinois, and our class and our webinars are really meant to try to motivate well owners to understand their systems better and understand the basics to help you ask better questions for those that are in your area and your local, um, you know, experts. It's not to be the expert for everybody. And so um, there's no way, you know, I've spent my entire career, almost 30 years in Illinois, um, that I'm going to be up on the issues in New York or, you know, Oregon or wherever, um, where they may have different types of geology and some of those things. So the best support you can get is locally and within your state or territory. And those folks have dealt with the issues in your area. They know your regulations and your local conditions. And that's really where you should go first, along with your contractor. So, um, you know, your county health department, your well and driller regulators, whether that be a DNR or a public health department or um, a DEQ, and co-op extension that may be at the county level. Um, or, uh, for instance, in several states now, co-op extension has developed these well owner networks that are um, similar to their master gardener program where you can go take training for a day or two and learn some information that you can then go out and help some of the well owners in your area um, who may not understand their wells very well and give them basic information uh, that can help them. And I know Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, um, Virginia, and Texas, and I'm probably missing somebody, um, have those groups and they're through Co-op Extension. Um, if you Google their web pages, you'll find uh, that stuff and, and they've got some good resources for you too. So um, financial assistance. There are programs um, in some areas that provide loans or even grants for well upgrades or home uh, repair and that sort of thing related to your wells. And um, many of these programs are income dependent. They're from groups like USDA and HUD, but um, some are low interest loans that uh, things like you can, you know, if you have a dug or board well or, or dug well or a well pit or an abandoned well you need to plug or seal, it's worth checking into. Um, NGWA has a resource page, a resource page for some of these opportunities, but you need to contact your county and state or territory agencies, like your DNR and your well regulators. Um, there may be programs, even at a local level, that will help you with some of these things. And um, you know, it's certainly worth it if you have a water quality problem or you not able to use your well uh, to look into some of these uh, programs, especially the low interest loan program. Uh, to make it more affordable for you to make that kind of change. So here's, um, this is wellowner.org. It's actually NGWA's, uh, the National Groundwater Association's um, page that they've developed for private well owners with information. And I've went to the um, finding the contractor financing page. And if you go to this website, um, if you scroll down, there's a group of, a list of nonprofits that have got funding through USDA, um, I believe, and HUD to offer grants for well work. And you know, in a lot of cases, this money is meant for the most needy, the folks who maybe can't afford it. But um, some of these loan programs are available to um, um, a wider range of folks. And um, you know, a loan at 1% over a 20 year period um, is a, a much easier pill to swallow than coming up with all the money you might need to replace your well. And so I just want to mention that information. And uh, all right. so. Um, I think I've talked long enough. What we're going to do, uh, we're going to try to do, is um, one, uh, if you've asked questions throughout, that's great. We're making a list. Um, what I'm going to do is we're going to take a five-minute break. And I know we uh, didn't do that last time, but I want a chance to look at the questions and, and put them in order. We'll have them up here on the screen that way rather than my reading them off. And uh, so we're going to take a five-minute break. And when I come back, we're going to go through some of the questions we have for uh, the time we have remaining, which looks like about a half hour. And um, again, if you asked a question and we don't answer it today, 
um, eventually it will be on our website. We're going to we're developing a FAQ section. I know those of you that might have been on the first webinar may be wondering where your questions are. Um, we're a small group and uh, we're working on things uh, as fast as we can and once it's ready um, we'll send out an email to everybody and let them know. Uh, there's been a lot of great questions um, and so um, hang on we're gonna be off the air here for just a few minutes and uh, then we'll come back let's say um, uh, let's just take a five minute break from right now and I've got about one minute till two. Is that right? Alright so at four after we'll be back. <laughs>